Hi, this is Chris with Learn Web Logic Online, and in this lesson, I'm going to give you a brief overview of JMS or Java Message Service, and I'll also go over some JMS, some basic JMS architectures, and go over how you configure this within Web Logic. Since this course is geared more towards administrators and not developers, I am not going to dive into the inner workings of JMS. I'm really going to focus on the administration side of things. So. I'll go over what JMS is, but I'm really going to touch on how a basic high-level architecture of JMS, the various components within JMS, and how we can configure some of these components or resources within WebLogic. So what is JMS? Well, JMS is defined by a Java EE standard, and really it is an asynchronous communication method that allows applications or services to talk to one another asynchronously. So. So in JMS, you have producers, consumers, and destinations. A producer produces a message, and that message gets sent to a destination. And consumers consume messages from those destinations. So in the JMS world, there are two different messaging paradigms. There's what's called point-to-point -point messaging and publish-subscribe messaging. So in point-to-point -point you have one or more producers, but you only have a single consumer. So a single consumer connects to a destination to consume messages that are published. And the consumer can be active or passive. So what that means is that if a, if a publisher creates a message and that's sent to a destination, the consumer doesn't need to be connected to that destination actively. Messages on <clears throat> On those types of so messages in a point-to-point -point model are persistent whereas in a published subscribe model you can have one or more producers and also one or more consumers so consumers can register to receive these messages from these producers however in order to receive that message the consumer must be connected to the destination in a pub sub messaging model now, within WebLogic, there is a notion of durable subscribers and persistent storage. So we can actually um, persist messages for clients, and by clients, I mean durable subscribers that are not connected at that time. And so when the client does connect or that durable subscriber connects at a later time, they'll be able to pick up the messages that they missed. So messages can be in a variety of formats, uh, binary, text and XML. And in the lab that accompanies this lecture, we'll actually create a simple text message. So I want to take a moment to go over the components of a WebLogic JMS architecture. One of the most important pieces is the JMS server. Uh, the JMS server is a uh, management container for JMS destinations. Its primary responsibility for those destinations is to maintain information on what persistent store is being used for messages in a persistent store or persistent storage. Persistent storage is either file-based or database-based. And when messages get produced, they are stored in persistent storage. And when consumers consume those messages, they're removed from that persistent storage. JMS servers can also be configured to enforce quotas. Um, you can actually configure quotas on your destinations. So your messaging queues or your messaging topics that define how many messages can exist on this destination or how large it can get size-wise. Another component of the JMS architecture are JMS connection factories. So when an application gains access to WebLogic JMS, the first thing it does or has to do is look up a connection factory from the JNDI tree. The JNDI tree is the, if I haven't gone over this before, it's the Java naming and directory interface. It's essentially a tree, it's a hierarchy of Java EE resources, everything from applications to EJBs, JMS, JDBC, any resource that you create or application that you deploy within WebLogic exists on the JNDI tree, and you can look up those resources using JNDI syntax. So a JMS connection factory is important because it's what gives the client its connection to either produce or consume messages. And then there are JMS destinations. So if you haven't figured it out by now, <laughs> there are JMS destinations are what hold JMS messages. And there are two types. There are JMS 
cues and topics. And I'll go over those in detail a little bit later on. Another component, and this is specific to WebLogic, is what's called the JMS module. A module within WebLogic is is used to hold the configuration for a variety of JMS resources, such as connection factories and queues and topics. And so a JMS module is actually represented by an XML file on the file system. And you'll see this in the lab at the end of this lecture. And I've already mentioned JNDI, the Java naming and directory interface. Clients and servers use JNDI to look up these resources, to look up JMS destinations and connection factories. So when we create a connection factory or a JMS topic or queue, we will see when we look at the JNDI tree that the resource is in that tree. And last but not least is the persistent storage. This is the file-based or, or database-based persistent storage for messages. So let's say we've got a JMS queue and we've got a producer that's authoring messages and pushing them out to this JMS queue. Well, if the client is not connected, these messages will back up. They'll pile up. They're persisted in storage. They're not maintained in memory. They're persisted either in a file-based store or a database-backed store. And when the client finally connects, it consumes those messages. So here's a really simple picture of a JMS architecture within WebLogic. We have a producer or consumer that connects to the JNDI tree to look up a connection factory using the connection factory's JNDI name. Once it looks up the connection factory, the connection factory gives the client back a connection to the destination, whether it's a queue or a topic. And that client is able to produce or consume depending on the type of connection it received back. So what you're seeing here is what an application developer would code in their application. They would actually have to code the JNDI lookup and then the and then the methods to retrieve connections from the connection factory and then connect to the destination in order to produce or consume messages. So JMS configuration within WebLogic is structured in a similar fashion to a JDBC data source. So the config XML defines the JMS server. When we create a JMS server in the admin console, we will see this reflected in the config.xml. Then there's what they call a module descriptor file. And this is similar to the JDBC data source in the sense that there's a separate set of XML files for defining the other, the other JMS resources, such as destinations and connection factories. And these module descriptor files are referenced in the config.xml. So when we create and configure JMS resources within the admin console or through WebLogic scripting tool, we are creating them in what's called a system module. And it's the system module that I mentioned earlier that's referenced in the config.xml but lives in a separate subdirectory under config slash JMS. There are other types of modules. So as a developer, you can actually define your own JMS resources in your application. And so when you deploy your application, these JMS resources get configured. Now, that's that may sound highly convenient. However, you can see there may be a challenge with developers maintaining control over what JMS sources get, get created. Because resources that are created within an application cannot be managed by an administrator. So an administrator cannot monitor or reconfigure or retarget JMS resources that are defined within an application. So there's several different types of JMS resources that you can create. The first one and the most common one are the queue and topic destination. These are the main types of destinations that you'll be working with within WebLogic. Then there are the connection factories, which we went over earlier, templates, so I can actually define a template containing a set of resources, of pre-configured resources that I can use to deploy over and over. I can also define quotas on my destinations, and these are tied to JMS servers. So a JMS server, as I mentioned earlier, will enforce a quota that you define. And an example of a quota is that I can actually enforce how large the maximum size of a JMS message or how large the JMS destination gets in terms of number of messages or byte size. Not only are there queue and topic destinations, but there are distributed destinations as well. A distributed destination is a 
logical destination that contains queues or topics that are distributed across several web logic servers. So a distributed destination is a single set of destinations that are distributed across multiple servers within a web logic cluster. But a client sees them as a single endpoint. So an application that uses a distributed destination is more highly available because WebLogic provides load balancing and failover for the members within that destination. Now you'll hear this term, members within a distributed destination. A member is either a topic or a queue within a logical group of destinations. So another interesting type of resource is a foreign server or a foreign JMS server. You can actually connect WebLogic to a remote JMS server. Whether it's WebLogic or not, it could be TIBCO, it could be ActiveMQ. You can connect JMS to those systems by creating a foreign JMS server. And when you do that, when you configure a foreign JMS server representing that remote JMS server, whether it's third party or if it's WebLogic, that JMS server appears in the WebLogic's local JNDI tree. The benefit of that is that applications that are running in your domain do not need to connect remotely out to a foreign JMS server. They can connect locally and WebLogic handles the traffic between the application and the remote JMS server. So when we configure WebLogic JMS, typically we start with configuring persistent storage. When we create a JMS queue, we need to specify persistent storage ahead of time. And this can either be file-based or database-based. Then we create a JMS server. And JMS servers are typically targeted to, to a managed server. Um, we don't typically target JMS servers to a cluster. WebLogic does not allow that. JMS servers are singleton services and they are targeted to individual managed servers. The next thing that you'll create is a JMS system module. If you recall, the system module is really a configuration container. It will hold the configuration for the JMS resources that you're going to create, such as a JMS destination. And that can either be a topic or a queue or anything that we talked about in the last slide. So I want to go over something important. WebLogic has these naming requirements for its resources. The reason for that is, is that resources cannot have the same name. I'm not talking about JNDI names. JNDI names need to be unique, of course, because there's a single JNDI tree that's replicated across all the members within a WebLogic domain. And so there can't be any naming uh, collisions. So if I've got, a J if I've got an application that, that creates a resource on a JNDI tree, and then I've got another application that creates that same resource with the same name on that JNDI tree, you're going to get binding issues. That's not what we're talking about here. When we're talking about naming requirements, all resources must have a unique logical name. So if you recall, in the previous lesson, we talked about creating JDBC resources. We defined a logical name and a JNDI name. And the logical name is what you see when you're looking at the admin console and you're looking at that table of resources. So that name must be unique for servers, machines, clusters, virtual hosts, and just about all system resources. And by system resources, I mean JDBC, JMS. And that goes for, for not just a single domain, but if you're connecting one domain with another domain, then, then resources need to be unique as well. So I can't have a managed server in domain A with the same name as a managed server in domain B. When I connect these two domains together using cross-domain security or some other mechanism, WebLogic will throw exceptions. And nothing and no resource can have the same name as the domain name. So in our labs, we've created a domain called demo underscore domain. We cannot have a resource with that same name. So in lab exercise number six, we'll walk through creating a variety of JMS resources in our